Good evening. Welcome to the British Library. Uh, delighted to introduce tonight's event, uh, The Further Queer Adventures of Alexander the Great, Boyfriend, Activist and Porn Star. I've not actually had the chance to introduce an event like that in all my years at the British Library, so fantastic start. So well, my name is John, I look after the events programme here at the Library, and this evening we are delighted to uh, see it, what we call a coming together of some of the three illustrious names in the study of sexual identity in history. Uh, the centrepiece will be a talk on Alexander the Great by Professor Lloyd Llewellyn-Jones in the centre there, after which he will be talking to... Uh, uh, ben Miller and Hugh Lemmy of the Bad Gays podcast and book fame. Uh, later on, at the end of the conversation, you'll be able to put your questions to the speakers. Those watching online at, at home will be able to fill in the uh, questions format below the video window. And those of you here in the normal way, put your hand up and wait for the microphone. Of course, the event accompanies the British Library exhibition on Alexander the Great, which has only got a couple more weeks to run until the 19th of February, so please do get a look at it. It's, people are loving it. It's a story, not of archaeology, but of storytelling. Two and a half thousand, give or take, uh, years of storytelling about Alexander, of which there have been many, you'll be surprised. Um, and of course, it's uh, LGBT plus History Month, and we're delighted to be hosting the event in the context of that as well. So Hugh and Ben um, created the Bad Gays podcast uh, in 2019 to explore the histories of queer people who may have been overlooked in history for their sexuality. Uh, everybody from the Emperor Hadrian to uh, anthropologist Margaret Mead, to Lawrence Arabia, J. Edgar Hoover, and of course, Ronnie Cray. So uh, Hugh himself is, uh, just next to me here, is a novelist, artist, and film critic, and filmmaker living in Barcelona. He's an author of four books. Uh, he writes on sex, culture, history, and cities for many magazines and journals, including Freeze and Architectural Review. And as an artist and filmmaker, his work has appeared in numerous international institutions. And his uh, partner in crime over on the other side is also internationally based over in Berlin, Ben Miller. He's a doctoral fellow in global intellectual history at the Freie Universität. And he's also been a member of the board of the Schwulers Museum, the world's largest independent institution dedicated to archiving and preserving queer histories and visual cultures. And together they wrote last year the book, Bad Gays, A Homosexual History, which is on sale at the bookshop tonight. Uh, and they'll be signing copies after the event. And those who want to buy the book, uh, if you're watching online, there is a books tab at the top of the page. And also, uh, our main speaker tonight, Lloyd, will be signing copies of his book, The Persians, his most recent book. Thank you. That's enough from me. Over to our team. Thank you. Great. Good, good evening, everybody. Am I on? Good. Um, lovely to see all of you here, or to hear all of you here, and to see only an enormous glowing light that has completely <laughs> blinded me. Um, and thank you, John, for the invitation and for the lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Ben Miller. I'm going to talk for 30 seconds about what bad gaze is, and then that he'll introduce himself, and then we'll introduce Lloyd and get to uh, Alexander, the main event of the night. Um, so Bad Gaze is a project that is about trying to investigate the um, untold, darker side of queer history. All of the people who we are maybe not as eager to claim during the um, rainbow-bedecked Pride Months, which seem to be multiplying. If you live in Germany, uh, have a passport from the US, and do a lot of work in the UK, you have no fewer than three separate um, <laughs> LGBT plus history and Pride Months. Um, which is great for, for bookings, but, um, but anyway, um, that's, the, that's the point of it. And to try to connect the kind of more complex and deep and thoughtful conversation that we have about queer history when uh, we're among ourselves, when we're among friends, when we're in our uh, intellectual and our activist communities with uh, broader and more mainstream publics. Um, Hugh, do you have anything to add? Do you want to introduce yourself briefly? No, I think you did a great, great job. Oh, great. OK. Um, well, then I will get right to introducing uh, Professor Lloyd Llewellyn Jones, who will be giving a talk. Then Hugh and I will be um, asking a couple questions each. And then we will open the floor up to all of you. And then uh, we will all be um, over wherever the books are, hopefully selling and signing dozens, um, if not tens. Uh, so Lloyd Llewellyn Jones is professor of ancient history at Cardiff University. 
He specializes in Achaemenid Persia and in Greek social cultural history and in the reception of antiquity in popular culture. He is the editor of Edinburgh Studies in Ancient Persia and Screening Antiquity for Edinburgh University Press. Born in South Wales and educated in Hull and Cardiff, Lloyd travels extensively throughout the Middle East, especially in Iran, often leading cultural tours. He has acted as historical consultant for major Hollywood movies and for television documentaries, including Oliver Stone's Alexander in 2004, whose soundtrack was playing when we came in, <laughs> and to which we were saying backstage we really think that we should have been sort of lowered in a big burst of dry ice <laughs> in one of these balconies. Lloyd is the author of several books, most recently Persians, The Age of the Great Kings, which is on sale at the bookstall tonight. And he also contributed an essay to the British Library book accompanying the exhibition. So Lloyd. Thank you very away. much. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here. John, I want to thank you uh, sincerely for the invitation. And I also want to congratulate everybody who's been involved in this magnificent exhibition, which I saw for the first time this afternoon. Uh, it really is a, a magnificent achievement and shows the importance of um, the, the longevity and the, um, the spread of, of myth-making in its best possible way. If you haven't seen the exhibition, please do go. So, the further queer adventures of Alexander the Great. And I'm gonna start with a quote comes from uh, an online site called fanpop.com. I think he was probably gay. There was a translation error. It was supposed to say Alexander the Gay, but someone translated it wrong to Alexander the Great. This is gonna set the tone for the evening. <laughs> Um, I should warn you, forewarn you, there are a few fruity images, all right? But um, I've tried, I'll try to move them on as quickly as I can. Oh, don't, <laughs> <laughs> When Robin Lane Fox's biography of Alexander the Great first appeared in 1973, it was marketed, I quote, as the dashing story of the spellbinding young gay who conquered the world. Of course, in those innocent, far-off, dreamy days, and certainly within the ivory-towered publishing houses of academe, gay had a very different resonance, although we should remember that it was also in the early 70s that homosexuals began to define themselves through this use of the word gay, outing themselves in the first open declarations of a specific sexual identity in Western culture. Now, interestingly, by the time Lane Fox's Alexander went into its fourth edition to coincide with the release of Oliver Stone's movie, Alexander, in 2004. So post-gay activists, uh, post-AIDS, but firmly in the era of the metrosexual male, Alexander was marketed by the publisher as being, I quote, tough, resolute, fearless, a born warrior and ruler of passionate ambition. So passionate then, but no longer gay, it would seem. Ever since the 20th century discovered that horrid thing Freud called sex and began to consider sexual preferences as an integral part of sexual identity, Alexander has been scrutinized and analyzed for what his love life said or says about the man himself. In his pulp historical scholarly book, um, Alexander's Lovers, for instance. Andrew Chug notes that, I quote, to understand Alexander well, it is necessary to follow his heart more than his politics. The question of Alexander's homosexuality, once the preserve of scholars such as Tarn, whose determined attempt in 1948 to straighten the matter out, as he said, no pun intended, I'm sure, and future, uh, to, uh, and close future discussions down, met only with Badian's very famous hatchet job of a dissection of Tarn's old pedantic conservatism a decade later. The sexual revolution of the 60s and the 70s stimulated even classicists to think in new and exciting ways, and Alexander's sexuality was thrown wide open for debate in classrooms, on gay political marches, in popular literature, magazines, and in pornography. And the strengthening gay communities of the liberal West happily embraced the ancient ruler, not only as a gay prototype, but as a gay hero. In recent decades, enthusiasm, enthusiastic if flawed 
gay interest websites have been busy appropriating Alexander as a role model for the modern gay man. So much so, indeed, that um, Castle's queer, uh, queer companion entry dedicated to the Macedonian conqueror notes that Alexander is a staple in the long list of historical gays that can be claimed from history. Now, claiming is one of the traditional ways in which gay men and women and increasingly transgendered individuals have sought to demonstrate the political clout and the social and cultural worth of their sexuality or gender identity through identification with historical figures who have supposedly shared their same-sex desires or idiosyncratic gender characteristics. Oftentimes, this has meant penetrating a smokescreen set up by straight historians who have underplayed, misrepresented, tried to remove or purposefully erased all questions of queerness in order to protect their subject. Famous individuals from classic an classical antiquity have long provided inspiration for gay men and women who regard the so concept of a queer golden age as aspirational, a blueprint for future free from prejudice, judgment, ridicule, and hatred. Out of this idea emerged lesbian sexuality championed by Sappho and male homosexual identity and not simply the platonic sort as emphasized by the figure of Alexander, a vigorous, attractive, active, masculine sexual identity that empowers gay men. Now the sexual legacy of the Greek world still lurks under the surface, already there to bubble up and no one has ever forgotten that Alexander the Great indulged in homosexual acts. This is why Alexander heads the list of nine gay men and four gay women at gayheroes.com, although why the Apostle Paul is there <laughs> um, is anyone's guess. I really can't get my head around that, but that's for another day <sighs> and another exhibition. Now, this talk is not about the real Alexander. How can it be? As this uh, magnificent exhibition shows, um, it is not about the historicity or even the histori historiography of Alexander and his sexuality, although these thorny subjects continue to perplex and divide both Alexander scholars and Alexander devotees. This talk is not concerned with ideologies surrounding ancient expressions of sexual identity either, but it does look at contemporary expressions of the sexual and the gendered self because the focus here is on exploring modern concepts of homosexual identity which have attached themselves to the figure of Alexander. It's the modern perception of Alexander's sexuality, his queerness, that is concern, of concern to me. There are, of course, numerous queer Alexanders each adopting a very different persona in the ever-shifting, ever-morphing, multivalent world of queer identities. Alexander can be the romantic hero dreaming of a better world, safe in the arms of his boyfriend. Alexander can be the porn star gagging for rough sex with his squaddies. And Alexander can even be the American boy next door. There's a really charming musical that came out off-Broadway in 2014 called A Kiss from Alexander, and I'm not going to get time to discuss it tonight, but I can answer some questions on it if you want. So he's even, you know, Alexander the Broadway baby is always there as well. Alexander then has been thoroughly claimed by the gay community, and this gay claiming of Alexander affords homosexual men a sexual fantasy figure with, which, with historical kudos and, for some, uh, a clear element of camp as well. Any treatment of the perception of Alexander in modern popular culture um, must engage with the celebrated Alexander the Great trilogy, uh, comprising of Fire from Heaven, The Persian Boy, and Funeral Games of the novelist Mary Reno. Gore Vidal, described Renault's Alexandriad as one of the most unexpectedly original works of art of the 20th century. Renault was preoccupied with Alexander. He appears in other parts of her work, too. He is alluded to at the end of her first historical novel, The Last of the Wine, in 1956, and in The Lion in the Gateway, 1964. Renault's telling of the Persian invasions of Greece for young readers, 
calls, um, draws into mind uh, the golden Alexander who will come in the future. Further, it seems that Alexander served as an inspiration for other characters. Renault's biographer, David Sweetman, finds echoes of her Theseus, for instance, in Alexander. But fundamental to Renault's preoccupation with Alexander was her belief that he was indeed Alexander the Great. She was not impressed with those who demonized Alexander or defended him weakly and insisted that he should be judged by the standards of his own day. In her notes to The Persian Boy, she comments on, I quote, a present-day outbreak of bad-mouthing which goes far beyond a one-sided interpretation of the facts to their actual misrepresentation. Her insistence that Alexander be judged by the standards of his own day also extended to the question, of course, of his sex life. Renner was absolutely clear that Alexander lived in a world where men had sex with men as well as with women. Renner herself, of course, was bisexual. And part of her motivation for shifting her novels set in the contemporary world to those set in the world of ancient Greece seems to have been to have the opportunity to write about same-sex relationships more easily. The transition is witnessed in her last contemporary novel, The Charioteer of 1953, which has been called a study in homosexual love. Alexander served the subject of same-sex relationships primarily because of his famous attachment to Hephaestion. In Fire from Heaven, the intensity of the relationship is not in doubt, although the sex is never described. Renault's Alexander prioritizes the soul over the body, and she quotes Plato's Phaedrus in a section prior to a scene in which Alexander sleeps with Hephaestion. For his Hephaestion himself, Alexander's lack of interest in the physical aspect of their relationship is depicted as a source of some clear frustration. Renault conjures up a fascinating response by Hephaestion to Ptolemy's assumption that he is having a lot of sex uh, with Alexander. I'll read a section of this out for you. He was getting at least what he would not have changed for any other human lot, and the world could know it. The rest was his secret. He came to what terms he could with it, pride, chastity, restraint, devotion to higher things. With such words, he made tolerable to himself his meetings with a soul-rooted reluctance, too deep to suffer questioning. Perhaps Olympias's witchcraft had scarred her child, perhaps his father's example, or thought Hephaestion, Perhaps it was that in this one thing he did not want the mastery, and all the rest of his nature was at war with it. He had entrusted his very life much sooner and more willingly. Once, in the dark, he had murmured in Macedonian, you are the first and the last, and his voice might have been char charged with ecstasy or intolerable grief. Most of the time, however, he was candid, close, without evasions. He simply did not think it very important. One might have supposed that the act of love was to lie together and talk. Hephaestion suspects that Alexander feels that sex endangers his very virtue. And while Reno allows Alexander to be attracted to women, his lack of having any interest in sex with them is, however, emphasized and underscores the peculiar partnership he has with Hephaestion. All in all, the Alexander that emerges from the pages of Mary Reno is somewhat chaste. And I think chastity is the hallmark of Alexander's relationship with Hephaestion in Oliver Stone's 2004 biopic, too, Although Stone himself has not stated if he was in any way influenced, either directly or indirectly, by Renault's novels. 
The film's implications are that Hephaestion is Alexander's soulmate, his true spouse. But Stone does not make the sexual relationship explicit. Indeed, in a scene that takes place on Alexander's wedding night to Roxanne, we have the teary-eyed Hephaestion admitting himself into the bridal chamber and proffering Alexander a ring, which he slips onto his left hand, suggesting to a modern audience marriage. But what follows is a protracted sex scene between Alexander and the snarling, rampantly sexed up Roxanne. It is furious lovemaking, perhaps suggesting Alexander's inability to make any form of emotional connection with his bride. It has been claimed that Warner Brothers, the studio that financed Alexander, alongside the German company Intermedia, took steps to de-emphasize the movie's gay aspect in its advertising campaigns. The trailer, for instance, denotes, uh, de declares Alexander's passion for Hephaestion while showing this love scene between the king and Roxanne. A line from the film, part of Ptolemy's narrative, however, says clearly that, quote, Alexander was defeated only once by Hephaestion's thighs. And indeed, for his part, Stone said that his interpretation of Alexander's life and character were true to the historical record. This is what he has to say. Alexander, to me, is the perfect blend of male, female, masculine, feminine, yin, yang. He could communicate with both sides of his nature. When you get to modern day focus groups who will get offended in Hawaii or Maine, you can't get out of it. It'd be naive not to be concerned, in America anyway. I didn't know there would be a parallel situation going on. And this parallel situation he refers to here is that that in the wake of the USA presidential election of 2001 and the passage of prohib prohibitions on gay marriage in a number of states, homosexuality had resurfaced as the focus of debate and controversy amongst cultural critics. For instance, Bob Velivsky, a film critic with Focus on the Family, a Christian group, warned of the film's potential to corrupt. There will be people, he said, who will see Alexander the Great's bisexuality as applauding that lifestyle, and unfortunately, it will lead some young boys and some young men down a path that I think they will come to regret one day. <laughs> but interestingly, for many gay men, Alexander simply did not live up to the expectations either. Not only did they anticipate a bromance of epic proportions, but they expected some really good man-on-man on-screen action from um, testosterone-fueled bad boy Colin Farrell and puppy-eyed, pouting heartthrob Jared Leto. But what they got was a tepid, shy, and ambiguous story of boy-on-boy -boy infatuation at the best. Interestingly, then, it's fan art and fan critic that actually comes into play and gives us the idea of what the public, the gay paying public, actually wanted. So we find, for instance, some fans responding favorably to the soft core um, functioning of their relationship. And even if a physical relationship is involved, um, others in fan fiction tended to look for the raunchier elements of that side of the expression, and others indulged themselves in full-on fantastical pornography. To meet the need of a, <laughs> of a disappointed demographic, early in 2006, Spanky Boys <laughs> Studio, and I'm sure several of you are quite familiar uh, with their releases, released Alexander the Great Gangbang, a hardcore skin flick which centered on a surprisingly passive Alexander's erotic encounters with his soldiery. The warrior orgy turns into a gangbang and Alexander is on the bottom. Would you like to join? As we've seen, much of the attention given to Alexander, especially on gay interest internet sites, 
is to claim him as a homosexual prototype and often to provide contemporary gay men with a role model with a historical gravitas and no shortage of sex appeal either. The nature and character of Alexander is caught up in current multiple projections of queer identity. Certainly when Stone's Alexander hit the screens for the first time, the inter internet erupted with gay fan sites, perhaps seeing in the movie issues which simply were not there. Long before the film's actual release, for instance, rumours were already circulating that Stone was making and promoting a gay-focused and gay-friendly life of Alexander, and social media speculation ahead of the film's premiere insisted that it would fixate on the ruler's gay identity. As we've noted, angry voices were raised at this censure, and the, a particularly vocal opposition came from social media users in Greece. In Greece, the movie Alexander is causing great sadness because he is depicted as gay, although no irre irrefutable evidence has been proved that he was. It's just a theory, and thus a myth. If it has not been proven that he was, I think Hollywood is wrong to portray him as gay. But then again, what else can you expect from a left-wing liberal movie industry? In November 2004, a group of 25 Greek lawyers threatened to take legal action against Oliver Stone and to sue Warner Brothers for the defamation of Alexander's character. However, eventually on viewing Alexander before its official release date, the lawyers dropped their case, although they urged Oliver Stone to include a clear coda in the film's opening titles that Alexander was a work of fiction. This Stone rightly ignored. Meanwhile, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation welcomed the film's premiere, arguing that Stone broke new ground for historical blockbusters in showing a man who unashamedly loved other men. The threatened lawsuit did not mark the first time the subject of Alexander's sexuality had caused controversy. Two years earlier, hundreds of Greeks had stormed an academic conference when a speaker presented a paper on the subject of Alexander's homosexuality. The events, which took place at the Institute of Balkan Studies, Seventh Symposium on Ancient Macedon in Thessaloniki in October 2002, are recalled by my friend and colleague, Professor Daniel Ogden, who was himself presenting a paper at the event. Um, he's told me this many times over a glass of wine, and it makes for a great story, but I'm going to quote um, the, the official version that he gives. Advanced publicity had attracted the wrath of local nationalist, to spare other words, party, Laos, to that evening's session, and the leaders duly arrived with mob and camera crew in train. Some 40 police were deployed to protect the speakers. The principal incitement was Dr. Kate Moritzen's paper on homosexuality at the Macedonian court. But offense was also taken at the adjacent papers. My own, says Daniel Ogden, a war of witches at the court of Philip II. Philip could never have been a part of this kind of black magic, unchristian coven. And also Ernst Badian on the death of Philip II. And Badian's crime was to have doubted the Hellenism of the Macedonians. The three of us were branded agents of Skopje. A day later, the national newspaper Stochos ran with an article headlined, So Who Are These Anti-Greeks? Noting that Daniel Ogden has written tens of books in order to demonstrate that the ancient Greeks lived in a dark age of magic, prostitution, homosexuality, bastard children, and adultery. Now, the intolerance shown towards the conference speakers and the disregard for the process of historical investigation was compounded and endorsed by the mangled conviction that, in essence, Greece has always been an orthodox Christian society and that the Christian mores of the modern Greeks were shared by their pre-Christian ancestors. Christianity, of course, comes into play often in this debate. In 2013, for instance, American Republican Senator for New Mexico, Bill Shearer, decided to attack the state's endorsement of same-sex marriage licenses. 
he used Alexander to voice his dissent. Archaeology, he stated, shows the importance of, of the family unit working together as the first and most basic unit of human cooperation. There is overwhelming existence that the unit of mom, dad, and children has been encouraged from the earliest pre-written record. Alexander may have indulged in homosexual activity, but he married a woman. <laughs> Interestingly, the US <laughs> Army's don't ask, don't tell, don't pursue policy, which had come about as a compromise during the Clinton era in Washington so that gays might remain anonymous in the military, also was challenged by the systematic use of Alexander the Great. Would Alexander the Great be allowed to serve in the US military if he were alive today? Asked one South Carolina journalist in 2006 having heard of the dismissal of Alexander Nicholson, a US Army linguist who was removed from service by, some, by somebody who had outed him in his unit. Online arguments for the presence of gays in the military is often endorsed by Alexander's brilliance on the battlefield, even if those championing him are sometimes factually a little off key, I quote from one source. Alexander the Great conquered the known world with a gay army. <laughs> Another writes in a blog that, <laughs> I love this one, homosexuals are among the world's greatest killers, always have been. <laughs> and Uncle Sam expert, wants to, ex, uh, to recruit expert killers. Alexander the Great was a real swish. <laughs> Such flawed, if essentially good-willed, uses of Alexander might strike some as eccentric, but in the face of a still aggressive, widespread homophobia, gays essentially represent an enemy within. The employment of this image of Alexander in the process of the normalization of gays in the military, no matter how distorted that image might be, must ultimately be something positive and empowering. In this light, a blogger twists the standard rhetoric of online discrimination and speculates how Alexander might have felt about having straight people infiltra infiltrating the ranks of his army. Citing a fictional fragmentary letter dated 325 BCE, written by a Macedonian general to Alexander, he offers evidence of a survey of troop attitudes towards straits in the military before turning his attention to the intent behind Alexander's marriage to Roxanne. It's worth quoting in full. Dear Alex, I've interviewed our troops as to whether there are straight people among us, as you commanded. Here are some partial results. 10% believe that there are no straight people in Macedonia, but since we want to put some foreign people in service, and recently the def defeated Persians, there is a possibility that they may be straight troops. Our troops do not oppose to serving with straight people. As you know, Iran does not have homosexuals. 10% were too drunk to answer, as is expected from a Macedonian homosexual and alcoholic warrior. You should be proud. 60% actually do not care and say that they know straight guys in the army. 100% wonder if you actually like Roxanne and if you married her just because you like her or if it was for political reasons. Then he turns personal. It is not there's something wrong about dating women, you know, but they, they have seen your male lover, Hephaestion. He seems very sad, and when he's drunk, he weeps. All men are bitches, is what the troops have heard him yell. That reminds me, I brought the flowers and the I'm sorry card for him you asked for. It has a teddy bear, as you ordered, sir. Should I put it's just politics in it? I send you many kisses and you will be present in my erotic dreams. <laughs> Signed, General of HHRR and Parties. In order to celebrate the newly published landmark edition of Arian's biography of Alexander the Great, the NU, uh, NYU Center for Ancient Studies hosted a conference in 2011 aimed at exploring the writings of Arian, which are so central to the myth-making of Alexander. My colleague from Cambridge, Paul Cartledge, was asked to comment on the nature of Alexander's sexuality, and part of his answer ran like this. The evidence 
for actual sex with Bagoas is firmer than anything physical with Hephaestion, who may have been more of a bosom buddy, as we used to say, than a sexual partner. It's the relationship with Bagoas that is really extraordinary, isn't it? He was a non-Greek, a non-man, as the Greeks saw it. So Alexander, in having an openly sexual relationship with him, would have been transgressing all sorts of cultural and political boundaries. I'm inclined to believe he did and to admire him for it, and I'm very much with Paul on that point. So then, when it comes to Alexander's sexual predilection, does a eunuch, a castrated man, count at all? If so, does a eunuch arouse Alexander's gay desires or his straight desires? Mary Reno seems to answer that question decisively, since a decidedly erotic charge emerges in her, I think, the best of the novels, The Persian Boy. Originally, Reno had not intended to continue the story of Alexander after Fire from Heaven, but she became quite bewitched by the idea of this Persian eunuch and played with him constantly in her endeavor to uncover something more about Alexander's sexuality. Thus, it is Bagoas, the castrato, who evokes the active gay Alexandria rather than his more famous friend Hephaestion. While Fire from Heaven is all about love, the Persian boy is absolutely all about sex. Reno deliberately presented Bagoas, this eunuch character, not as a stereotypical eunuch, effeminate, corrupt, running to fat, but as beautiful and noble and worthy of Alexander's attentions. Now, when Oliver Stone came to retell his version of the story, he seems here to have adopted Reno's vision completely. Casting a handsome, lithe, and sensual Francesco Bosch, a trained ballet dancer, as the eunuch. At one point in the film, Alexander goes to bed, and Bagoas climbs in with him, and gently they kiss. On Alexander's wedding night, when Alexander beds Roxanne, Bagoas briefly enters the room, sees that there is now someone else in bed, and discreetly leaves. But in another scene, Bagoas dances publicly for Alexander and Alexander kisses him openly, publicly, and absolutely unashamedly. It's no wonder that Alexander and Bagoas had such a resonance with the gay movie fans. In fan blogs, fan sites, mainstream gay media, gay male fans were given what they finally desired. But there is more here than meets the eye. Bagoas clarifies the active sexuality of Alexander in a way that Hephaestion had not. It is Hephaestion who is frustrated and impotent rather than the castrated Bagoas. Ultimately, for both Reno and Stone, the sexual union between Alexander and Bagoas symbolizes, of course, the king's desired union of East and West. At the conclusion of her notes to the Persian boy, Mary Reno observed of Alexander that, I quote, no other human being has attracted in his lifetime from so many men so fervent a devotion. This passion has persisted well beyond Alexander's own lifetime, as exemplified by Mary Reno's own response to him, which was specifically elicited the question of the sexuality of Alexander. Taken as its starting point, the iconic account of Alexander created by Reno in the 60s and 70s, I've tried to explore here several 21st century responses to Alexander by people who identify themselves through a range of genders and sexualities. What we've witnessed here are numerous queer Alexanders. The chaste boyfriend, the active lover, the bisexual, the de facto eunuch, both male and female, the sex god, the porn king, and the gay warrior. These images reflect the advances in and the development of sexual and gender liberation experienced in the West from the 1960s onwards, but they also reflect these advances that are not uncontested 
particularly by some Christians and nationalists. Alexander continues to be a source of inspiration and heated debate. For some, though, Alexander is not just a top 10 gay hero. He is the ultimate fantasy whose kiss we continue to crave. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you, Lloyd, for that um, absolutely fascinating romp for the representations and uh, I think misrepresentations maybe of um, Alexander the Great. I was really struck by this um, depiction in that um, sort of seminal cinematic masterpiece, Alexander the Great Gangbang, <laughs> that, that, that he was represented as a bottom yeah. or a receptive yeah. sexual yeah. partner. And I was quite struck because not only um, have I never seen him sort of representing that role before, but I'd never thought about him in that role either. Um, how does that re re relate to sort of contemporary um, Greek and Macedonian understandings of um, homosexuality, uh, same-sex desire? Um, and, and I guess how, how has that then gone on to uh, be taken on by um, uh, homosexuals later in history as a representation of power and, and a sort of masculinism? Yeah. It's really interesting. Um, it's the only evidence I've come across for, for thinking of Alexander in that kind of way as, as, a, as a bottom, uh, maybe a power bottom, as a, to use that kind of lingo. Um, but it, it blows the Greek conception of what homosexuality, or if we can even use that word, of male to male sex out of the water because, of course, um, within the Greek mind, um, the passivity of the, the sexual recipient of penetration um, is inevitably, therefore, um, seen as the, the weaker, the more feminine, the, therefore the more out of control, lacking what the Greeks call sophrosyne, which means self-awareness, um, um, moral probity, uprightness. Um, so Alexander's character in, in, within that film just completely disappears. Um, so it's, 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 not a, it's, it's not at all a, a, a typical way of seeing it. And what's really interesting about the filmic versions of Alexander, of course, the, the casting of Alexander is always paramount, isn't it? You know? So we, we got Colin Farrell in the 2004 one, Irish, known at the time for his hard drinking, hard living. I mean, it really Stone was exploiting Farrell's um, sexual persona, a very aggressive male heterosexual persona, of course. And several decades before, in Robert Rosson's 1956 Alexander, it was my compatriot Richard Burton who was cast in, in the role. Uh, again, you know, notorious, this is just pre-Liz Taylor days, but still already had made his name in Hollywood for being um, uh, a hard drinker, a hard liver, uh, and, a, and, a, and a lover of the women as well. So, you know, there's always this kind of trajectory in, in Hollywood where we can't dismiss, we can't kind of dislocate the historical figure from the actor who plays them at all. So I suppose if Stone had really wanted to, um, to foster an image of a gay Alexander, he could have either have cast an unknown, so we could read onto this unknown anything we want to, or uh, a more uh, out uh, gay actor, which of course they don't exist in Hollywood yeah. as we know. Certainly not in 2004. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about this um, kind of imperial nostalgia that flows through this whole memory culture coming through Alexander that you described. And you talked about sort of the, as you said, the flawed but good-natured side of it. Um, and it was, it was interesting for me to think about that. I think Hugh and I are very used to thinking about the um, flawed and not necessarily very good-natured side of that imperial nostalgia. I think it's fascinating that in all of these depictions of Alexander, he's racialized as white um, and as whiter than the other people who are around him. Um, and I think it is also interesting that it is interesting to remember how this kind of gay imperial nostalgia is often, and this is something that comes up a lot in my work in the sort of German context, is linked to a politics of misogyny, anti-Semitism, um, white supremacy, really extreme misogyny. I mean that 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 the that when I was that was Joe thinking, laughing about that that 
um, blog post about how homosexuals are expert killers, because you find stuff, stuff like that written in German masculinist magazines in the teens and 20s by people who become Nazis, who are basically saying, we are the greatest warriors because we're so powerful because we've just rejected women entirely out of sort of hatred. And well, so it's, it's, so it's, it's a two part of the kind of Sparta, you know, the, the myth of Sparta. The myth of Sparta, yeah. yeah. So there's basically two, two questions coming out of this. One, what happens when claiming goes bad? Mm. And two, how does today's claiming, um, even the kind of claiming that brought us all here tonight to talk about this, um, potentially play into even kinds of, even contemporary kinds of, of imperial nostalgia? I mean, we are here in, in the British Library, and the Persian manuscripts didn't fly here on the, by themselves, you know. <laughs> When we, when we deal with any aspect of Alexander's story, inevitably we are dealing with east-west conflict, um, east-west conquest, um, and the resolution of that as well. Now, it's really interesting that um, if you were to trace the development of Alexander portrayed in um, scholarship since the Second World War, there was a real aim after the, the Second World War by people like Ernst Badian to try to make Alexander um, a kind of arbiter of wanting to bring the nations together, you know? This is the time of the founding of, uh, of, of the United Nations and so forth. This idea is, you know, that what Alexander was trying to bring through his conquests was um, a, a sense of togetherness, a oneness. And this is something that Stone picks up in his movie, so on the balcony at Babylon, you know, Babylon is not shown as a kind of um, captive city um, by these Macedonian marauders. Um, instead, it, you know, it's shown opening its doors to Alexander, welcoming him as the liberator. Um, so it's kind of like um, op operation. This is a year after the yeah, US invasion exactly. of Iraq, So, right? so it, it plays on the whole idea. Flowers. Absolutely, op Operation Babylonian Freedom is what's going on there. <laughs> uh, okay. we, we see it very clearly. So they, they are aware of that. But what I, what I found in Oliver Stone's movie is then, while he's aware of these big themes, he cannot, like so many others who come before him, help but indulge himself in the standard Orientalist tropes all the time. So, you know, the, the, um, the, when Alexander goes into, uh, into the harem, for instance, you know, uh, of Darius, what we have there are girls, you know, in yashmak stroking Persian kittens and all of this kind of thing. And, and, and Stone and I have actually spoken about this. And I've said, you know, you, you're, you're really getting it wrong then. You're sending the, you know, we're stuck in the same world as Elvis Presley's harem scarum, you know, where he does exactly the same thing, go east, young man. Um, sort of thing. And Stone recognized the, the, the faults he'd made there, but of course it, it, it's too late then, it goes out. So there's no, um, there's, there's no happy ending to, to that narrative at all, unfortunately, um, because I think in, in, in his 2004 film, um, Stone never really addresses the fact that Alexander's empire was one of, of colonization, of course. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm also really fascinated by the, this sort of role that Mary Renault plays in sort of establishing the, this very modern representation of, um, of how we understand Alexander. And obviously, from, from as soon as people have started to identify themselves as, as homosexuals or even as inverts um, through to like modern gays, there's, um, people have always looked back to, to antiquity for these models to say we've always been here. But um, I was struck by the, the, the coincidence that um, Fire From Heaven was released in 1969, the same year as Stonewall, mm -hmm. um, and it emerges sort of, sort of contemporary, contemporaneously with this um, gay liberation movement, but also this new urge to find these, these historical icons. Um, did, did she have like an overpowered effect in sort of setting the stage for this contemporary understanding of Alexander, and specifically when you're talking about where they sort of um, remove the sex, but cement the sexuality as a sort of as an identity rather than as a, a form of behavior? I think what comes out in the major studies of, of her, Sweetman's excellent biography more than anything, he doesn't really acknowledge that she's in, in step with the time, okay? Mm. But what he does acknowledge all the time is, is her own personal journey to her own sexual liberation, as it were. So as she matured, when she came into her 40s and her 50s, that's when really she found her own sexual identity. She began a long relationship with, with other women, with another woman, um, and therefore became more empowered to, to, to use antiquity in that light. But I don't think she's ever particularly aware in anything that I've read about her of 
um, the, the wider zeitgeist with what's going on, unfortunately. It would be lovely to say that she is completely in step with this, but it doesn't really seem to be in the case. But does a market find her? Even yes, yes, it, yes, it does, most, most definitely. And you really see it with the, um, the publisher's uh, choice of, of imagery for the, for, yeah. the, for the book covers, for instance. One or two of them are on display in the exhibition here, and there's a really good one for the very first edition of The Persian Boy, for instance, which is shown in the exhibition here. It's actually a, a Leonardo uh, da Vinci sketch but it's actually of a, of a, of a Renaissance woman, mm. but it's, it's quite erotic. It's a, um, the he-she theme is definitely there as, as the, the, um, the, the figure turns away from us but, but continues to hold our gaze. It is something about drawing us into it. So, uh, and you'll see that during the 1970s and into the 80s, um, the, the, the publishing um, imagery that's utilized um, becomes increasingly um, Gay-centered, I suppose we could say. Yeah, mm. Mus muscle, muscle curuses and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Great. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and then after that, we're going to go to the audience. So start getting your questions ready if you have them. Um, my final question is about this figure of uh, Bagoas, who I'm really fascinated by. Um, the reception history in the West of this kind of um, racially othered third gender figure um, is vast. It's a huge, it's an enormous projection fantasy um, for generations of uh, gay men um, as they're kind of creating themselves. I'm the most familiar with the US and German context, but I know this is true in the, in the British one as well, um, in which in this kind of search for social roles that is a part of the response to the pathologization and the medicalization of the 19th century, anthropological and ethnographic records in the colonies become a place where you go to figure out this question, like, who are we, what do we do? And there's this, and there's this, there's this search for these kinds of figures. Um, I'm wondering how you see the reception history of Bogoas playing into that story. Um, and I'm also wondering if we know anything more about the actual dynamics of the relationship between them. I'm really interested by the characterization of this as a relationship between equals when Bogoas was not his equal. Like how, what was the... What, what do we know of the actual relationship between them, and then, and then how do we think about the, the reception history in that, in that broader light? As with everything about Alexander, we know nothing <laughs> of his real life. Everything we have with Alexander comes at least 150, 200 years after his death. The one thing I say to my students all the, the time who, yeah, who, who want to um, work on Alexander is don't, um, because, <laughs> because you will never get close to this man. We're always dealing with, with the mythology, with the legend. And, but what, what is interesting is that straight away, the, the Bagoas legend is woven into that narrative huh. by Arian and by Curtius, um, both of whom pick those up. So, so there is, um, and yet it comes from a, a longer Greek fascination with the, the unit character. Now, within um, Bagoas' own society, within Achaemenid Iran, um, castrati, castrated men, um, were, were part of a highly sophisticated court culture. Mm -hmm. um, they were castrated so that they could serve as body servants of the great king, um, of the great king's women, principally his, his wives and concubines. Um, and because of the, their castration, they, they, occup they occupied this strange position as a sort of third sex. They really were seen as, as, as something specifically third sex. But there was no prejudice about it. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they were combined, you know, confined to the harem or anything like this. We, we have lots of evidence in Assyria and in Persia from genuine bona fide Near Eastern sources that these individuals could serve in the army, they could serve in the government, um, but what it meant was, um, as we see later on in Imperial China, for instance, if these men put themselves through the act of castration, which is, you, you don't do lightly, you can imagine the death rate was enormous for this, it meant that you could enter into a, a higher level of society and actually gain mm. real, real power. But what the Greeks do with it, almost immediately when they come into contact with eunuchs for the first time, as the Persian Empire encroaches into the Greek world, is they begin, first of all, a fantasy on the, on the, the idea of the castrato, um, but also this kind of using it as this Orientalist trope of um, decadence um, and a kind of, uh, you know, a despotism which demands um, castration of these, these young men, for oh. instance. So Euripides, in his play, 
um, uh, Helen, for instance, about 419 BC, he has this um, Phrygian character who is clearly meant to be a eunuch. And this Phrygian is given this long, long um, passage to sing. Um, and of course, we should remember that you know, Greek tragedy was a, was a sung event, not really recited. And this, um, this must have been a tour de force, rather like the sort of Queen of the Night aria in De Zauberflöte, where, where this um, Greek is imitating the falsetto voice of this thing. So they play with it, constantly playing with it, but they can't accept it. Xenophon says, for instance, that um, the, the Persians created eunuchs. By castrating them, they made them like dogs or stallions, and that they took away their kind of, you know, their, their masculinity and made them um, abject servitude was something about them. It's completely the opposite of what was really going on with inside that society. Great. That's well, fascinating. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we are now able to take a few questions from the audience. Someone will bring you a microphone. There's a nice person wandering. Uh, put your hand up real high so we can see you because the lights are real bright. I see someone here in about the uh, third row. Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful um, tour de force there through, through that sociology of um, sexuality. Is there a sense in which um, the relationship between Alexander and Bogoras, kind of because Bogoras is portrayed as not quite being a man, as this ambiguity, that in today's view in culture, which is often dominated, or you could say is often dominated by the, the straight male gaze, that that relationship's okay because Bogoras wasn't really a man type of thing. I think, yes, I, th I think that's absolutely it. He's not really seen as a man. Um, and moreover, he's not Greek either, of course, you know. And in the Greek mind, the Easterners, the Persians, were effeminates. So according to Hippocrates in his Airs, Waters and Places, the people who inhabit the, the west of Greece, so the Celts, they tend to be cold-blooded, um, stupid, but um, good warriors. Whereas the people who inhabit the east, in the heat of the east, are warm-blooded, effeminate, but very calculating. That was, means that these two polar opposites mean that to find the ideal person, the ideal man, was to look at Greece itself, of course, which is the perfect, perfect center point. And this is the world, the way in which the Greeks saw their world, you know, it, it is the othering of others. So everything in Greece works as this polarity, man, woman, um, polis, countryside, us, them. It's all part of that same rhetoric. They see their world in very, very narrow ways in that way. Yeah. And you can, you, can, you can pile them together. So foreigner, woman, you know, that all stacks up. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank as you. It does, as it does now. Um, I just wanted to add, we have a question up there, and the microphone will we'll go to this person. Um, but I wanted to add, if you're watching online, we were told that someone is looking for your question. So ask your question in the chat, and someone will find a way to get it up to us up here. But yep. Uh, so this is about the reception of Reno's work when it came out. So I, I remember myself being completely, like a young teenager in the early 80s, going, oh my God, when yeah. I found it in the library. Um, and everything I've read about it since, it seems to have had a really positive, res critical mm -hmm. reception. But even in the 1980s, when I was a young gay man, uh, um, there was not very much positivity around, right? Mm. So I'm just wondering if it's the case that Reno's work, I've always wondered this, Reno's work actually had only a positive reception or there were also a negative reception to it. And if it did only have a positive one, why was that in a pretty queer phobic time? Yeah, it's a good question. As far as I'm concerned, I've, I've only ever seen positives. I've never seen a, a really bad review of it, ever never even saying that it's out of kilter, it's out of touch. What's the reason for that? Classics is the reason. You dress anything up in a toga, right, and it becomes presentable, okay? We've, <laughs> we've been trained in the West to think that way for centuries now, okay? Um, you know, you, you put any um, scantily clad maiden in, in, in something which is just pinned at your shoulders and it becomes fine, you know, we can look at it, you know, it's not nudity. So I think, really, 
um, whether she knew it or not, Renault harnessed that. Yeah, and I, th I think that's the, that's the, the easiest answer, and I, th I think the honest answer. Um, we can dress this up in, in classical robes, and it suddenly becomes acceptable. Always has done. Great, we have someone in the front row here. Hello, thank you. Um, I'm intrigued about the Alexander musical. <laughs> when did it come out and how gay was it? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty freaking <friggin'> gay. <laughs> <laughs> so it came out in 2014. I happened to find it just by like, doing this kind of web searches. So I got in touch with the uh, lyricist and the composer and they were very good. They sent me a, a recording of it. And the opening shot of, that I had on here, this real muscle Mary, that's a guy called Craig Ramsey who played Alexander in it. Um, it was very much an off, 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 off Broadway production <laughs> with very low budget, quite clearly, but great aspiration. So um, one of the things I really like about it, um, it's very tongue in cheek, the whole thing, as you can imagine. And they use the concept of the Greek chorus to, to turn into the Greek chorus boys. Uh, and so they, they play on that all the time. The, the lyrics are painful. The story is transparent, um, and I'm not surprised it didn't get any further than it did, but I love the, I love a, I love a trier, right? <laughs> sure. Do we have any, I see someone here next to the, next, next to, to the, the cameras. Camera. Yeah. Behind the camera. Um, one of the sort of classic blunders in the history of thought is to sort of take the ideas that we have now and the way we conceptualize things like medicine or science or whatever is like more or less correct. And the people in the past were just sort of mistaken or perhaps, um, you know, just unaware of what they were doing. Um, and I just wonder that when you sort of historic, or not you in particular, but in general, when sort of figures like this are historicized as gay or trans or whatever, um, do you think that there is a potential danger in sort of taking sort of modern conceptions that reflect sort of very specific relations of say like production and social reproduction and projecting them onto a past in which they perhaps don't really hold? Of, of course there is, ab absolutely. But I think, I think it is warranted because for me as an ancient historian, I love my, I love my discipline. And I wanted, to, I wanted to speak, you know? So myself and my colleagues can do the nitty gritty and know exactly where things are in their place. And I, had I wanted to, I could have given you a more sort of, you know, Alexander in the mind of the Romans who created him, for instance. But I think that it's absolutely appropriate in, 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 under the heading of reception studies for each one of us to take any aspect of history and to claim it for ourselves, to read it as we need to see it. Um, I think it's an important thing. It's, uh, it's empowering, it opens debate. And what I always say to my students in Cardiff is that ancient history is not a dead subject. You know, it's, it's not about, it's not over with. It's ongoing, it's constantly evolving. Let me give you a really good example of what's happening right now. In Iran, as you know, my country I know very, very well, there's a great crisis that's going on um, with women trying to find their voices, trying to remove the veil that's dominated them for, for the last 40 years. Um, the way in which that is being used with a real currency, which the Islamic government don't know what to do, is by using the figure of Cyrus the Great. He is the Alexander for the Iranians, okay? And they say that, you know, he was the, it's a myth, but they say that he founded a, the first ever Bill of Human Rights, for instance. It's a myth. The real thing is in, the, there's, a, there's a cylinder in the British Museum. It was made in uh, Babylon. It was written in Babylonian. It has nothing to do with Iran at all. But the Iranians believe it. And if they want to believe it, let them believe it. Because give them something to hold on to in their history, you know? And I think, therefore, it's, it's an appropriate thing to do. I want to, do you want to add something? Yeah, no, I just this is a, also an interesting point that comes up time and again when we're doing the podcast, and obviously we're, we're reaching back to people who lived in a time where there was no conception of um, homosexuality as we understand it today, or, and definitely being gay, but we, we, we talk about them sometimes as gay people. Um, and in having that conversation, if you, as long as you sort of talk, talk through that you're working, 
then actually it doesn't just shed light on their understanding of, of contemporary forms of um, identity formation around sexuality, but it also sheds quite a lot of light on the way we ourselves have constructed our own forms of identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that sort of give and take between the past and the present in, in, in casting people in current sort of modes of thought is, can be just as enlightening. Absolutely. Yeah, and between the present and multiple pasts, right? Because oftentimes we're talking about people on our show who lived 100, 150 years ago who are talking about the classical past themselves. And so these are like all these different temporalities occur and, and, and watching how people across these different temporalities make these kinds of... Um, of, of affective connections with and projections onto historical figures. Um, and yet, it's also always complicated. Something that comes up again and again in the show is um, this question of figures who have been claimed both by either gay or lesbian history, especially during the kind of years of liberation, and trans history. And you know, you'll, you'll get someone in, you know, in the, most, the most absurd version of this, right? as absurd as the internet meme of the you know, tomb of the um, army of lovers and the historian saying, well, I think they were just very good friends, right? Um, is you know, the person who gets execute, kicked out of the army, um, is serving in the, in, the, in the army as a man, uh, is discovered to have been assigned female at birth, is kicked out of the army, uh, protest that they're a man, has been married to a woman, goes by male name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and then you find the article about them and it's called A Lesbian History Of, and it's like... Um, and, but, but there are a lot of places where that tension is actually genuinely quite complicated because these memory claims can be very simple and positive and empowering, but they can also be conflicting and they can be used for terrible ends Right, what's done with Frederick the Great during by by gay Nazis in the in the early 30s is not a particularly um, it's, it's not a histor it's not a process of historical identity formation or of or of this kind of claiming um, that I think that I would hope any of us here um, would be particularly comfortable with. And so these things are like I agree with you. You have to be really careful, um, but I still think it's interesting to do it. I think we must we must know the reality. We must try always to aim for the reality. Try to get to the nugget. And the philologists and the art historians and the historians must get together and keep that alive and keep doing that. But I think beyond that, let's allow history as it really is to breathe because history is, is not finished. It's, a, it's not a final project. You know, the history has not been written. History is evolving. It's amorphous. It changes. It breathes. It does its own thing. It contracts and it always will. And we'll look back and we'll be able to identify what's going on right now in a hundred years time. But sometimes, of course, it's only hindsight that shows us where the trajectories are going as well. What did it mean for uh, queer life in Britain in 2023 that the British Library hosted yeah. a talk about <laughs> Alexander the Great? <laughs> yeah. Seriously, more questions. Hands high so we can see you. There's a couple ah, up here. We have, yep, back row. Over here. Yeah. Um, I'm interested particularly about you saying that you'd never seen a representation of Alexander as a bottom anywhere other than in that particular film because I had always been struck by his image as being quite feminine, like the flowing hair, the lack of beard. I mean, even the picture behind you is a bit of a twink. And like, I'm curious <laughs> about um, how the reception of his image as it is because it's pretty consistent in antiquity and the medieval, I guess, into the modern as well. How did people view him with his kind of boyish good looks and his youthful, youthful appearance? Did they take him for that? That's, that's a really good question. Now, this is probably the only representation of Alexander we have from his own lifetime. Um, it's a small piece about this size, and actually he's, you can't see it here, he's got little, little horns in his head. It's him as the god Pan actually. Um, so there was always this element of Alexander morphing into the divine anyway. But really, it's not until um, 20, 30, 50 years after his death that the Ale Alexander image becomes codified. And it's done, first of all, through his successor kings, who are all trying to sort of claim some kind of contact with him on coinage, for instance. So on coinage, you're absolutely right. I mean, he's always shown as a, as a kind of an ephib. So in this, uh, like James Dean, in a way, you know, caught in this, this, this bubble of youth, I suppose. Um, you know, we, we never see representations of him with a beard or, or you know, grown up as a, as a mature man. So you're, so you're right, he's frozen in time. 
um, in, in a lot of respects. Um, there are points that always are played up with Alexander. So you'll notice in the, there's a sculpture that we see as we first go into the exhibition. Alexander's sculptor from life, apparently, always tried to capture the, um, oh, the, I don't know, the, the movement of the man. So he always seems to sort of hold his head at an angle or, or kind of off-center to look back at us. The other thing they always go for are these kind of leonine locks, this kind of cow's lick that he has at the front and an over-large eye, very often seen in silhouette, of course, in a coin, which kind of looks sort of into the middle distance, as so always looking to the heavens, where, of course, you know, the gods sit and where, of course, he, will, uh, he, he, he resides as well. So it's a very, very manufactured image. You're absolutely right to say it. And, and it stays that way. So you might know the famous Alexander Mosaic, which was discovered in Pom Pompeii, um, where you see him on horseback defeating Darius III. And again, all of the hallmarks, you know, the, the, the tussled hair, the big eye, they're all there. So it seems to be, you know, just like Elizabeth I created a kind of patent for her imagery, Alexander had that done for him um, in successive years. What's fascinating about this exhibition, of course, is it blows all of that out of the water because we see so many Alexander faces there, you know, and as every society wants him for their own. They morph him into whatever he needs to be, of course, which is really fascinating. Mm. And there was maybe one more. I see. Was that what? Did you use one more? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just realized now that the Alexander movie came out the same year as another uh, colossal based on classics, which was Troy. Yes. And uh, <laughs> it's quite known that Alexander really loved the Iliad, which is what Troy is based on. And Alexander identified with Achilles, uh, and there has been suggestion that uh, there were identification between Ephestion and uh, Patroclus. And I was wondering if there was um, um, a connection with these movies coming out the same year, in particular in the case of uh, um, the relationship between Achilles and Patroclus in the movies, where it's very downplayed, there is no queerness in it. Patroclus is portrayed as a cousin of Achilles, mm -hmm. very young, and Achilles' affection towards him is basically just familial, mm -hmm. uh, while there are more recent storytellings about that, like Madeline Miller's The Song Achilles, which instead portrays a queer relationship. So was there a debate going on about queerness and the classics at the time? Or? Um, certainly, um, I, I really don't know if Wolfgang Peterson and, and Stone were ever in communication about this. My, my instinct is to say no, um, they, they weren't. Um, again, the idea of, of, of the casting of the star becomes really important here because, of course, they cast Brad, Brad Pitt as Achilles. And, of course, he comes... I've called this in, in the book I've written about um, the Hollywood, Hollywood in history. Um, I've, I've called it um, the archaeology of stardom. It's almost like a, a, a movie star is like an archaeological site. You know, and you've got to dig beneath. So they got the, the, their latest movie. But for instance, you know, Charlton Heston, um, at the bedrock of Charlton Heston will always be Moses, right? And no matter what he does, you know, Moses is always there. So with Brad Pitt, you know, you've got Thelma and Louise and all this kind of, you know, sexualized, perfect man, fight club and all of that. And on the top of that, then they layer Achilles. But it's just um, Brad Pitt in armor, right? I mean, there's no change whatsoever, you know? And one of the opening scenes of the movie, shows, um, there's, a, there's a reveal showing a sleeping Achilles, Brad Pitt, and the camera pulls back to see a woman next to him, and then pulls back more to see actually he's having a threesome with two women, you know, so there's no doubt uh, straight away that this is a straight Achilles, you know, um, because of course in Hollywood, uh, from its formation really, cer certainly from the 1930s anyway, um, pre-code, you know, uh, post-code, um, no Hollywood star is going to risk his identity by playing that kind of role, you know. Things are morphing now, maybe, but certainly back in 2004, there was no question um, that that could, could happen. Within the, the context of um, antiquity, however, you're right, Alexander was obsessed with, with the Iliad, not so much Odyssey, Iliad, always, um, but again, all of our knowledge about his fascination with this great epic only comes from Roman writers who are keen to make that link, of course, between Hephaestion and Alexander and Achilles and Patroclus. 
Interestingly, of course, within the Iliad itself and within the tradition in uh, later classical Greece, Achilles was the passive partner and Patroclus, of course, was the, the more active one, which is something that most people don't want to even think about anyway. Again. Well, oh, is that a question from online? Yeah, we, have, we have an online. Well, it's, it, I wouldn't normally read out a statement rather than the question, but this is so good. <laughs> I'm going to do it. So this is from uh, Julia, in, who's watching in from Brooklyn, NYC. So not a question, more like fan mail. Thank you, Lloyd Llewellyn Jones, for the breathtaking and loving whirlwind of a brief history of this ancient heartthrob. <laughs> the past hour has been a catharsis of joy. <laughs> I've never encountered another person who's read Alexander's Lovers. Alexander has been he my hero since the early 2000s. Drawn in by Corin Colin Farrell's thighs, <laughs> I, stayed <for> the <laughs> I stayed for the love of Mary Renault from The uh, Nature of Alexander, The Fire from Heaven and Trilogy, and The Charioteer, and the historical aspects of Alexander's legacy. Alexander's compassion for female captives, his embrace of Eastern cultures, his ever forward trend-setting ways, Beards are so Philip of Macedon. <laughs> are just Pardon so. Me. <laughs> <laughs> are just many examples of why, generation after generation, we continue to fall in love with his legacy. Thank you for giving us this lecture. It was equivalent to a rock concert for me. <laughs> I wish I could have been there to, in person to thank you and shake your hand. Thank you from the nerdiest hetzis female in Brooklyn. <laughs> you, oh you've made me a very happy lady. Oh, well, that's very kind. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much Julia. Very kind. Thank you. Well, can we possibly top that? No, that uh, seems like a perfect place to, to, to end Do we need to bring it to, to an end, end there? I think we do. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, once more, a big round for Lloyd. <laughs> Llewellyn Jones, Professor Lloyd Llewellyn Jones at Cardiff. Um, and stick around, come talk to us um, for the low, low price of one of our various books, uh, which will be around to sign. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night.